Thank you, Sandra. There's not much to add from my side, but I try to give you a little bit of information about what's for me a patient selection for a micropulse laser. These are my financial disclosures. So in general, what do you expect from an ideal treatment for your patients? Well, the procedure should effectively lower IOP. I mean, that's what we all want. We want the pressure to go down. It should enable the physician control over the treatment compliance. And that's really different from what you, exam for example, can um, have with a trabecalectomy. You need the compliance of the patient after trabecalectomy to get a good result. But on the other hand, with an ideal treatment, you are looking for something that despite the compliance of the patients, will work and will lower the pressure, even if the patient's not taking the drops after the procedure. You want to have a procedure that's repeatable, and you want to have a procedure that leaves future options open to use. And that, on my, or in my opinion, is a procedure which does not scar the conjunctiva. And from the patient side, and we often forget this, but that's completely different from what a doctor is looking for, for the patient, it should be well tolerated. That means it is a quick procedure, so the patient doesn't want to stay in the hospital for a long time. They don't want to have a long surgical time. Low downtown, dime time. That's really important with a fast recovery. Patients now are getting younger and younger, and even if they're elderly, they're getting more active in their private life and in their work life. So they want to be back to work pretty quickly, and they want to participate in their regular life activities. Patients like outpatient procedures. They don't like any pain and they don't want to have a negative effect on their visual acuity. So in my algorithm of treatments, I usually start with drops, then I go over to ALT, SLT. Then for a long time we had this treatment gap before we went over to traps, tubes, and at the end we did cyclodestructive procedures. This treatment gap was filled with a mixed procedure, a procedure that has all these um, criteria that I listed earlier. But these are also true for the micropulse technology. I did my first procedure nearly two and a half years ago, the first procedure outside the US, and since then we have done many of the procedures. And my setting is quite similar to what Sandra earlier told us. You can do it as an office or operating room theater um, procedure. You can do it in a small procedure room. It really depends a little bit on what kind of anesthesia you're using. I know some colleagues use topical anesthesia. If you do that, you don't need an OR. You can definitely do it in an office setting. I also use a cocktail. It's really comfortable for the patients, propofol, fentanyl, or thiopenthal and fentanyl. So you need something against the pain, which the patient could um, feel, and you need something to put the patient to sleep, that they are not kind of disturbed by the procedure itself when you touch the eye, when you move around with a laser, and when a little bit of heat is applied still to the tissue. If you use fentanyl, ask your anesthesiologist to give it a little bit earlier than um, the propofol, for example, because it needs some time before the action um, takes place and the pain is knocked out. At the end of the procedure, I still use a drop of atropin that comes from the G-Pro procedure because it's good against the um, inflammatory pain the next day. I patch the eye with an ointment, and the next day I use dexamethasone for one to two weeks, five times a day, and because potentially it could have touched um, the cornea, I give some ophiloxacin for three days only. You don't really need that. I recently started, instead of using dethamexazone, to use some anti-inflammatory drugs only, and it also works. Don't be surprised the next day and for the next weeks if you see some, um, some flare in the anterior chamber. That can still be present for the first four weeks sometimes. But in my experience, I rarely see any cells after the procedure. So the inflammation is not that big compared to other procedures with the laser. So let's look at patient profiles. I give you a couple of cases from my clinic. An 87-year-old Caucasian male, he was pseudophagic. He had advanced pseudoexfoliative glaucoma, which was progressing. He was on a lot of drops already, and he also had diamox pills already, systemic treatment. We do a lot of diurnal pressure curves, and his pressure was in the mean 23 with a range from 15 to 30, so really elevated. These are his fields. And they definitely, I think you agree, are advanced. So looking at what you recommend to these patients, you can do a trabeculectomy or a tube. You can do laser trabeculoplasty, which is probably not effective in this high pressure. You can do a G-probe or a MP3. Well, my first choice would have been trabeculectomy in this patient. But as a doctor, you can advise the patient 
but you don't make the decision. And the patient didn't want to have any surgery that involved a knife. So as a consensus procedure, we did a micropulse procedure on him. I was not comfortable to do a G-probe procedure because I was expecting to do the trap a little bit later. With the G-probe, you can have some inflammation, and with the MP3, you have less inflammation. And I wanted to have the least amount of inflammation in the eye in the case I had to do a trap pretty soon still. And the pressure went down to 14.6 with a range of 11 to 18. So this indication in this case was the patient refuses to undergo incisional surgery and you need a consensus procedure because you still want to do something for the patient and get the pressure down pretty quickly. Second case was an 86-year-old Caucasian female. She had a retinal vein occlusion in her right eye. Pressure was 50 on maximum tolerated medication and also on Diamox. She got a Vestin for the rubiosis she had. And I did two micropulse psychophotocollation treatments on her. When you remember the last talk, the swiping motion that you do is usually with the standard seconds, settings 80 seconds per hemisphere. My experience in neovascular glaucoma is that those patients need a lot of repeated procedures. So I do now more time per hemisphere in these cases. But this is my own setting. It's not the recommended setting. So I did it double amount of time per hemisphere and still had to repeat the procedure once. And the pressure went down to 19 on much less drops and no diamox anymore. So indication for MP3 can also be neovascular glaucoma. It doesn't always work that well compared to other kinds of glaucomas, but if you look at all the other options you have with neovascular glaucoma, they all don't work really well in these patients. It's a really tricky disease to treat. Another one is also 85-year-old Caucasian female pseudophagic. She had a primary open angle glaucoma, which was plus minus stable with moderate damage. She had prostaglandin, a beta blocker, alpha-2 agonist, and also local inhibitors. Her pressure was not that bad, actually, with a range from 14 to 21. That's her nerve fiber layer, and you see some damage, obviously. And then she developed topical irritation due to the drops. So I did a micropulse cyclophocalation on her right eye. Pressure is 15 now, six months post-op. And I took away those drops which potentially causes most irritation, so the prostaglandin and the alpha-2 agonist. So the indication here is if you have a patient who is stable with this glaucoma but doesn't accept the drops anymore, cause to irritation and non-tolerance. The last case I want to present to you is a 52-year-old male Caucasian. The IOP was decompensated in both eyes with a range of 34 to 48 in the right eye and 35 to 48 in the left eye with a mean pressure around 40 in both eyes. So a trap was definitely indicated in this patient in both eyes, but I didn't feel comfortable at the same time to do a bilateral trabeculectomy because of the complications we know, because of the um, visual acuity which will go down after the procedure, and also because of all the other side effects to the patient. So we did a trabeculectomy in his left eye, and I didn't want to lose the time until I would do the trabeculectomy in the right eye and just let the pressure to stay that high, especially if you do the trap in one eye, you have to get the patient off the diamox after that. So the pressure in the non-operated eye at that time would definitely be higher after the trap in one eye. So at the same time I did the trap in one eye, I did a micropulse procedure in the other eye. And if you look at the pressure, and that's, in my experience, kind of what you standardly see, the pressure was 43 pre-op. On the first day, there's not much of a change. It sometimes is the same, sometimes a little bit lower. But then a couple of days later, you see the pressure to start to drop. And it goes down to two months, and even three months, you can have a little bit more of pressure reduction after the procedure. And that's also important if you look when to repeat the procedure. I try to wait two months to three months to get the full effect before I judge and say, hey, you need another procedure, you need another MP3. <coughs> so advanced glaucoma on maximum medications, 82-year-old Caucasian female. After the trabeculectomy, the pressure was good. Then I did a suture lysis to get the pressure down a little bit. I gave five of you, and the pressure went up to 30. 
digital massage was not lowering the pressure anymore, so we did a needling. The pressure was four, but visual acuity decreased, and it took six weeks to get the visual acuity back to what it was normally before. Well, then the pressure went up again. What do you do now? Do another needling and risk that the visual acuity is going down again? I did an MP3. And the pressure came down, and what's really, really important for the patient, the visual acuity remained unchanged after the MP3 procedure. So to summarize indications for MP3 is uncontrolled glaucoma. It's definitely intolerance to medications. It's maybe newly diagnosed glaucoma instead of medications. You always have poor candidates for incisional surgery. Malcompliance, as I mentioned earlier, patients who come from far away in a rural area where the follow-up is not guaranteed. You can also do an MP3 in a patient with a poor visual acuity if the pressure is high and you want to avoid corneal complications over the time. Neovascular glaucoma is an option for an MP3. And you can do it after a GPRO procedure as well because it has a different mechanism of action. A failed prior outflow bypass surgery is also an indication for an MP3 after that. And last but not least, as an alternative to other mixed procedures or in conjunction with the other mixed procedure. If you look at these mixed procedures, usually you get the pressure down to 14 to 16. But if your patient needs a little bit more, you can consider doing a mixed procedure and at the end do an MP3 in addition. So the MP3 reduces IOP and medication. Even if we don't understand the mechanism of action fully yet, it probably increases uveoscleral and trabecular outflow. It causes less pain and inflammation compared to the traditional GPRO procedure. And in my experience, I don't really see any destruction and any or a lot of inflammation. You see flares, I mentioned, but rarely see any cells. Thank you for your attention.